Hello and welcome to this Data Science Week webinar on getting started with containers. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Training and Communications Officer with Australian BioCommons and I will be your host for today. This webinar it has been jointly organised by the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre and Australian BioCommons. The Pawsey Supercomputing Centre is one of Australia's Tier 1 supercomputing centres and it's an unincorporated joint venture between the CSIRO, NCRIS, the Western Australian Government and four public universe, Western Australian universities. Australian BioCommons is building digital capability for life sciences with the goal of ensuring that Australian researchers remain globally competitive. We're doing this by providing better access to the tools, methods and training that life science researchers need. Before we begin the webinar, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yogara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Sarah Recroft as our speaker to tell us a little more about how to use containers and what to use them for. So Sarah is a Pawsey HPC Research Fellow, and she obtained her PhD in medicine from the University of Western Australia in 2020. She has a dual appointment between the Pawsey and the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research. She works to increase bioinformatics support and development at Pawsey, while keeping an active research profile at Perkins, where her research is focused on disease gene discovery in neuromuscular diseases. Sarah is joined by her colleague, David Adams from the University of Western Australia, who is also going to speak about his experiences of using uh, containers during his Pawsey supercomputing internship. So I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to walk us through containers and what to do with them. Um, thanks, Melissa. I'll just share my screen. Cool. Um, so this webinar is really intended to be a very high level introductory um, sort of overview of containers. So we've termed it the what, why and when. So you have an idea of what containers are, um, how they might be useful for you. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more about them and maybe applying them to the work that you're doing. Um, so um, in addition to the wonderful um, support from Melissa Burke from BioCommons, I also would like to acknowledge um, the folks at Pawsey that um, have helped put together some of this training um, that I'll be referring to. Um, Anne, who is always wonderful at organizing these sorts of things, and Christina Hall from BioCommons as well. Um, so with containers at Pawsey, we find that our users have um, lots of different applications for them. Um, it's everything from bioinformatics workflows to machine learning, to doing interactive R Studio and Jupyter sessions, to running web servers. So sort of anything you can think of, um, there's probably someone somewhere using a container for that application. They're really very versatile. Uh, so we also have um, put together a couple of interviews with researchers. Um, so these are available online at the Pawsey um, YouTube channel. So our first one is from our own Pascal, um, who was formerly a radio astronomy researcher. Um, so you can hear from him and also um, Philip Bayer, who is a plant um, genomics researcher at the University of Western Australia. So they both have a slightly different bent on how and why they use their containers and you might find that really interesting. I certainly enjoyed watching them. Um, we also have um, a whole webinar series on containers, um, which we will link to um, so that you can have a look at that if you're interested. So in order to understand how containers work, um, it's important to have a little bit of background on how programs typically run. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so for example, um, you have at the top here, you know, some, some programs or some software that you want to run. So just some random examples, MySQL, BWA, OpenFoam, and Pitch. So typically, um, when you run these containers, they have, uh, sorry, we run these softwares, um, they have 
other things, other um, programs that they are reliant on. Um, so these are called dependencies because the thing that you wanna run is dependent on having these other bits and pieces of software installed in the background. Um, and these libraries and dependencies are typically shared. So that's fine, um, except that if you have a lot of different programs that you're running, you may find that some of these dependencies are, are clashing or they might be incompatible. So this is a concept that we lovingly have termed um, dependency hell. Um, so you might find that you, know, you wanna update uh, one of your softwares, um, but that will break the dependency of a different thing that you're running. And so you're stuck um, because of these um, incompatibilities. So to give a little bit more of a concrete example, let's look at matplotlib. So this is a really popular um, Python library used for plotting various things. So say for example, I wanted to use both matplotlib version three and matplotlib version two uh, for you know, some reason, certainly happens. Um, so for version three, I need Python 3.6 and numpy uh, 1.11. Whereas if I wanted to use matplotlib version two, I need a different version of Python and a different version of numpy. So those two things uh, can't necessarily coexist together. They're incompatible. So if I wanted to run both, like what am I gonna do? Um, well, that's where containers come in. Um, and one of the really great things about containers. So actually what you can have instead um, are these self-contained environments um, that encapsulate, encapsulates everything you need for a software to run. So for example, all of the, um, libraries and dependencies for each one of these softwares you can see come in its own little box um, and they don't interfere or clash with each other and they don't interfere or clash with your host operating system. So for example, maybe, you know, your laptop um, and they run independently from the host machine. So that can be a really nice way to get around having um, lots of clashing dependencies uh, and can uh, make your life a lot easier. So as an example here, um, going back to our matplotlib, what would be in the container? Well, you'd have your um, actual software that you want, matplotlib version three, um, and then your various Python dependencies. And then in a separate container, which is again, independent from um, version three, you'd have version two and all of its dependencies. And so you can run them right next to each other or at the same time, and they won't clash um, or break anything, which is just super useful. So I guess to really just drive home this point, um, part of the reason why they're called containers is because they contain everything that you need for a software to run. Um, and so this obviously includes the libraries and dependencies, but can also include things like environment variables and install commands. Um, and then like a shipping container, it's very easy to port this little box or container around um, to other computers or to other people um, and it should just run. So what are, the, what are some of the um, specific benefits of containers exactly? Um, well, they enable workflows that are reproducible. So if you run the same analysis with the same data, um, you will get the same result every time, which is obviously really important for scientific computing. It's also robust. So you won't have um, some Maybe you'll have your version of R update in the background, um, you know, and that can break all of your workflows because all of the dependencies are now broken. And that usually happens before a big deadline or something. So if you have a container, you don't have to worry about that. It'll, um, it becomes immune to those sorts of issues. Um, also containers are very portable uh, because of their um, sort of self-contained isolated nature, it's very easy to ship them around. Um, also, they're quite scalable. So if you want to run something on your laptop and then suddenly scale up to, you know, a supercomputer, you can do that. Um, and because it can save you a lot of headaches, you can also increase your productivity, um, which again, in the scientific environment can only really be a good thing. So I guess um, I saw this graphic and I thought it really summed up the um, experience you can have trying to implement um, somebody else's workflow or maybe an old workflow or an old installation. So you read uh, the documents and it says you need this, this and this, 
install it in this way and you think, okay, great, I can do that, yeah, that'll be easy. Um, I definitely won't spend three months on that. Um, but then you actually get to doing it and you might find that there are things that are broken, there are dependencies that no longer exist maybe, um, the instructions aren't clear or they weren't documented very well, the host machine that you're trying to implement this thing on isn't compatible with the instructions that you have or something. So rather than having this uh, working reproducible install, you're left with a hot mess. Um, and you can spend really a lot of time troubleshooting um, and trying to get this to work. And maybe it will, and maybe it won't. So it can be really, really frustrating and a huge time sink. Um, so to talk a bit more about the benefits in some detail, um, it's, again, with this reproducibility and robustness, um, the reason why that is so um, strong in containers is that you have identical tool and dependency versions every single time. It doesn't change. Um, so you don't have any unexpected differences in output, um, which is an issue sometimes in scientific computing. Um, a different R version might ultimately end up providing you with some differences in your scientific output, um, which is not a variable that you want to introduce in your workflow. Um, and a container won't suddenly break uh, for the reasons that we discussed. Um, so with this portability idea, so it's actually super easy to send your exact computing environment to any system. Um, so this really saves a lot of time when you're moving your workflow to a new machine. Um, you can share your um, container recipe with someone. They can say, okay, container, run, do your thing. Um, and it'll be exactly the same as it was when you did it and you wrote it. Um, so this is really great for enabling collaboration um, with other groups. If somebody wants to uh, redo your workflow, um, it's also really handy if you have students or something like that. Um, you don't have to go through this work of setting up their environment on their laptop every single time. Um, you can just say, here's the container, go run it, go run this analysis. Um, and being able to share your workflow is really imp increasingly important for scientific publishing. Um, so if you are sharing a, like a bioinformatics methods paper, for example, um, if you can say, here is a container with the exact specifications that I use to generate my analysis, someone else can go and use that and double check your results or implement the work that you did. Um, so there's a, definitely a scientific reason to be doing this as well. So in terms of the scalability example, you know, what does that mean? So in practical terms, um, maybe you start off doing a particular analysis with just 10 samples, um, very small, and it can run on four cores on your laptop, right? Um, you set up your container, um, that's, you know, everything's great. And then all of a sudden your collaborators come through with all that sequencing data you've been waiting for and you get 10,000 samples, maybe. Um, and all of a sudden you can't do that on your laptop anymore. You need to use high performance computing, say what we have at Pawsey um, and scale up to thousands of cores rather than just four. So with containers, because um, you can ship them in like very easily between different environments, it's very easy to replicate what you were doing on your laptop on a much, much bigger system. And I, with um, productivity, one of the real great things about this is you can write one install recipe and use it everywhere. Um, I, can't over, I can't overstate the amount of time I have spent personally doing in my own research before I started using containers of um, the difficulties of, you know, you have a new virtual machine, or a new um, laptop and you have to reinstall everything and it always takes longer than you think and there's always troubleshooting and there's always headaches. Um, and you can solve this issue of dependency hell once and for all. There's not going to be any more clashes uh, with your dependencies, which is really nice. So then you can either do more work um, or you can uh, spend a little bit more time uh, having coffees and looking at cat videos online or whatever it is that you like to do in your spare time. So. Um, now we're going to listen to David's story um, about how he used containers. Um, so I'll hand over to you, David, but I will continue to progress the slides when you ask me to, okay? <laughs> 
All righty. Can people actually hear me? That'll be that'll be a good start. I can hear you. Yeah. All righty. So the way that I like to think about containers is kind of like putting pieces of fruit in a box, but there's barriers between the bits of fruits. So they don't get mashed up all together. And that's, I think, a, I think that's what's unique about containers and it makes them distinctly different from a machine where you're running a bunch of processes and virtual machines where you're making entirely different boxes to do everything. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, if I, I'm a technical person, so I was told I was allowed to do say one technical thing today. And I, the what if I want if I could have one thing that everyone takes away from this particular bit of a bit of the talk is that every time you're using every time you're using an operating system that is Linux like and has C groups and namespaces, which is every Linux distribution, technically that is the base level of what a container is. And as such, when you're running a container, you're not actually having any performance overhead like you would a VM in certain circumstances. But that's something pretty interesting. Next slide. So this is gonna be a bit more of a story about how I came into using containers because being a bit of a Linux nerd, I thought, oh, I can just run everything on all my own machines. I know how to install software. I know how to deal with dependency hell. Um, the answer is no, no, I do not. Because the thing is, is a machine is a machine. It's stuck in one place. You can't take it everywhere. and the excuse of, but it works on my machine doesn't cut it today and it needs to work on all machines. So a problem that I was encountering is I like making things in LaTeX. I like making slides. I like making PowerPoint presentation. Well, not, I make slides, I like making all my documents in it. And the problem is, is I work on these on the go, but compiling them is an absolute pain because text live is massive and it works but I want to be able to compile these on remote machines. I want to be, be able to compile them on demand, spin it up, and I want it to be able to be spun up very close to me so it's fast. And I also need this to be a cheap solution. So I couldn't ha host myself, have get a VPS or have a dedicated server or go somewhere else because that would be quite expensive. So what I ended up going down the line was, if you go to the next slide, is I went down the line of containers. That way I could spin it up on whatever computing environment was available to me. In this case, I chose Travis. Um, and what I did is I basically have this little container image, custom container image, which is a tiny, tiny little small Linux installation called Alpine. I put text live on top of it. And then I have it such that I can send it my source code file and it spits me back my nice, lovely PDF or whatever I like, um, whenever I want anywhere in the world. And that was really, really useful. And I could not have done that without containers or ex much extensive more cost by virtual machine hosting. And that's something that was very powerful for me. Moving on from that, next slide. Um, I've actually had the opportunity to use containers in a more scientific process. Um, so as a part of my uh, internship at the Palsy Supercomputing Center, um, I was tasked with deploying this um, latent space phenotyping experiment that been, had been done by a team in the US um, to Palsy resources on much, much larger data sets than they were, that they were dealing with. Um, this required, of course, supercomputing resources of Palsy, so we needed a lot of VRAM and GPU compute because it was a CN, uh, neural network-based model. And the main problem with this is it ran on a very, very specific and unfortunately very old version of TensorFlow, meaning that it effectively broke everything. And you can't really deal with that, especially when the, you know you come in terms of driver compatibility and the specific versions of the CUDA um, deep neural network library, they just won't work if you try to install them normally, either they're outdated or it won't work with existing installations of tools. So the only solution that I had to get to scale things up was actually putting everything, all the custom things, all the custom libraries, and even the NVIDIA drivers in some cases, chucked them in a container and spun up many hundreds of them to actually run my work workflow. And that was quite successful. And if we go to the next slide, I think that's, is that my last slide? So yeah, exactly. Created, highly customized. So Palsy uses Singularity. So we made that. And the big advantage is, is that I can make my programs easily GPU aware. So because we can simply just run the container that it's effectively like we have virtualized the operating system. So I can just directly look at things. I have the, those custom versions of the libraries and I could run jobs at much more at many different scales than I otherwise would because I could spawn up as many or as few containers as I wanted, which was very important because some of the data sets I was dealing with was only a couple hundred gigabytes. 
whereas some of the data sets I was dealing with were in excess of two terabytes, which is very important. And the final bit, once again, going back to my technical point is, I was able to highly customize the container image to be a lot smaller um, than your, a standard container because I just put exactly what I needed in it and that's all. And it meant that even compared to a type one hypervisor, it was still a much, much more performance solution. So I couldn't have done any better. And I think that's everything for me, a bit of a real story in, in containers. Um, awesome. Yeah, thanks for that, David. It's really interesting to hear exactly what you were using it for. Um, so we had ahead of time um, users, oh, sorry, participants um, in today's webinar send some questions through. Um, so we've gone through and answered some of those. Um, so this will be the sort of next section of the talk. Um, so one of the key things that came through was people asking, uh, what skills do you sort of need to start using containers? Um, well, the main thing would be having some sort of command line interface experience. Um, containers can run on Windows, Mac, um, or Linux. Um, that's the beauty of them. Um, but you would typically have a command line interface with those containers. Um, so something like Bash is very useful. Um, also the ability to either install or access um, the container programs Docker or Singularity. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a sec. And also just a willingness to have a go, you know, have a um, have a play with things, um, learn as as you go, maybe um, work through some tutorials, um, yeah, and just kind of build your familiarity with them. <clears throat> Oops. Um, so another question that came through, um, which was really pertinent, was: Do I always need to create new container recipes? So you know, if you have a thing that you want to do, do you need to build? Um, a brand new container recipe from scratch? And the answer is no. Um, there are container registries available online that host thousands and thousands of container recipes. So these range from uh, quite sort of um, basic um, plain containers. So maybe it's just a Python container or a container that holds R, um, but also you can have some quite complex containers that are really domain specific so for example, with my human genomics background, um, I would often find that somebody has already written an excellent container with exactly the really rare bioinformatic tool that I specifically wanted to use. Um, so I found that's really helpful. Um, so these are some of the main container registries. Docker Hub um, is pretty good. BioContainers has a very bioinformatics biology bent. Key.io um, is another really good one. So um, if you have a look, um, you can really be surprised at how much work somebody else has already done for you. So looking a little bit at a container life cycle, um, there's two ways you can kind of go about it. You can either look it up, look up a container on a registry and go, oh, well, perfect. That's exactly what I want. Um, pull it down to your computer and run it or deploy it. The other option is you can look um, at the registry and see what's available. Maybe you need to tweak some things or you want to build your own. Um, that's also fine. And then equally, you go on and deploy it. So something that you might hear um, thrown around a lot is a, the word or the phrase container engine. Um, so that sounds a bit complicated, but really what it means, um, it's a piece of software, uh, which is how the user interfaces with the container. Um, so if you, the user, are thinking, okay, I've got my container, cool, now I want to make some cool graphs with that, you would send your commands um, to the container engine, and the container engine would make um, your container do the work that you want it to do. Um, so Docker is the example I've put in this slide. Docker is um, probably the best known container engine or container solution um, software. Um, and it has kind of become a bit of a de facto standard, but there are others around. Um, so in particular, um, we use Singularity a lot at Pawsey. Um, so which relates to the next point of, can I run containers on HPC? And so with Docker, no, because you need to have sudo or um, admin privileges to run any Docker commands, which we don't allow every single user to have admin rights. Um, I don't have admin rights and I work here. So um, 
uh, it's pretty restricted. But with Singularity, you don't need these sudo or admin privileges to run your commands. Um, it also has a bunch of other nice features and it's very compatible with job schedulers. So we really use that a lot. Um, so another thing was, how do I write a container recipe? And so given that this is a really high level talk, this is just very introductory, but the key concept to take away from this is that you are putting Docker specific keywords around your normal installation instructions. So maybe you want to do, you know, sudo apt-get, um, something like SAM tools. You can download that with um, apt-get now. Um, so ahead of that, you would put something like run, um, which would make your container recipe do that command. Um, so there's a lot more information on that in the webinars, which we have previously produced, if you're interested in finding that out. And so I say um, putting Docker specific keywords because um, Docker recipes are again, sort of the uh, default or de facto standard. So if you wanna use Singularity, um, that can read um, Docker, contain, Docker recipe files. Um, so generally, if you're going to write your own container recipe, you would write it in the Docker syntax or the, the Docker way. And so if you have written your own Docker file um, and you wanted to build it, um, you can't do this on HPC because it requires sudo. You need to do it on your laptop or somewhere where you do have sudo access. But the actual command itself is pretty straightforward. Um, so sudo docker build and um, the image name. Again, there's more detail on this in the webinars, but it's just sort of a very brief overview. Um, something else that comes up or came up was um, the question of if you can share files with the host machine, um, and certainly with Singularity, you can, um, there's this concept called bind mounting. So basically that is saying um, you issue a flag saying bind and the name of the directory, and this is telling Singularity, I want you to make sure you can read and write to this directory on my local machine. Um, so that can be really, really helpful if you want to access files um, that you already have, or if you want to write out files um, to your local machine. Um, and uh, another question that came through was, should I put everything into one container? So, you know, you might have a whole bunch of different workflows that you want to do. Um, should you just put every single thing ever that you think you might need into a container? Um, so this could be called a monolithic container, a monolithic approach. Um, and so the difficulty with that approach, if you put everything in one big container, is that if you want to update uh, one component, um, you know, maybe you want to update your Python version or something, you have to rebuild um, the whole container. And then you're starting to edge towards this dependency hell problem that you're trying to escape using containers. Um, whereas if you have more modular containers, so like looking at the diagram here, um, you can see all of the different programs are split out into different containers versus just having them all put into one. This means that you can swap components as needed. So maybe I want to use the different R version. I can just swap that out. Um, it also keeps your tools and dependencies isolated. And then, you know, you only need to update one component um, as needed rather than having to rebuild the whole container every time. Um, another point that is just super useful to be aware of um, is containers can work really, really well with workflow managers. So you might have heard of some really popular workflow managers such as Nextflow, Snakemake or Cromwell. And so these all support um, use of containers. Um, so once you have um, written your uh, you know, managed pipeline with Nextflow or whatever, um, the user experience um, when using a container is pretty seamless. Uh, and this is also a really great way to completely lock down your workflow. Um, so that can be really great if, again, you are sharing your workflow with a collaborator or another team, um, or you just want to make your run runtime experience really, really smooth. So that sort of brings us to the end of the um, slides for today. Um, so just a quick summary, containers provide an isolated software environment. And because of this, it's reproducible, robust, and can be super efficient um, in terms of your workflows. And you can ship your code with confidence. Um, you know that it'll work for pretty much anybody else, which is a real benefit. Um, 
So the next thing coming up is question time. So I'll hand back, stop sharing and we can hand back to Melissa. Thank you, Sarah and David. That was a great introduction to containers. We do now have time for questions and answers, hopefully. So if you have a question for Sarah or for David, then please write that into the Q&A function and not the chat function in your Zoom dashboard, and then we can answer them for you. There, there is one question that has come through already, Sarah, and it is, um, when do you need to use a container? Is it only when you need to share the environment with other people or are there other times when you would use a container as well? Um, I mean, if you are trying to use um, like a software that somebody else has developed, oftentimes that will be available in a container. So you might use it um, in terms of making your own work a bit easier. So you don't have to do all of the installs um, or install steps to install your this new software locally. Um, also in terms of, um, yeah, so it's not just for sharing with other people, it's also for yourself, um, making sure that you can run your same analysis again in the future and get exactly the same results, uh, for example. So it's, yeah, also for making your own life easier. Pascal, I wondered if you would like to share a little of your story about why you chose to use containers in your work. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm uh, happy to um, provide a bit of information. Uh, so I'll give a bit of context. My background is, is quite technical. So uh, my start point for containers might be quite different from other people's start point from containers. I knew lots of programming. I had lots of experience uh, using Linux and HPC systems, high performance computing, and trying to get stuff to scale. So the, the, the uh, point that I encountered, and this is uh, relevant to some of the questions, is that I had a workflow that I want to do some data analysis in. And that workflow basically required uh, Python and R, uh, and then porting that everywhere and making sure that though the various versions that I wanted for Python, the various versions I wanted for R, which is the dependency held that Sarah referred to, was satisfying the fashion that I, I didn't have to keep thinking of what I needed to do uh, to install stuff. And in, in, in this case, at least the particular thing I was trying to do didn't necessarily run into administrative privileges. I just wanted to make sure that I, the workflow was long enough that I was like, I don't wanna to have to do this install over and over again. And it wasn't necessarily a dependency hell for me because I knew exactly what I wanted, but I didn't wanna to have to do this everywhere. And for me, it was like, well, if I just do this once and make a container, then I don't have to do it over and over again. And not only that, I can then take that container and go to places where I don't have admin privileges don't have necessarily full right access to everywhere else, don't have to do it again. I mean, it's one of these things that uh, is a subtle thing, but you'll find that if you are trying to install lots of small little files on an HPC system, you'll get complaints from the people running the HPC system, please stop writing lots and lots of tiny files because they're not ideal for parallel IO. That the, this, the, the essentially file system that's used for supercomputers. So I was solving lots of problems at that point, kind of unwittingly, like I wasn't necessarily knowing that this was a, a thing, I, like lusters cannot handle lots and lots of small files, but instead of having Conda, many versions of Conda everywhere doing all these things, I just had one and I could just take that around. It was portable, I knew how to interact with it uh, and it ended up being obviously reproducible. So that was the motivation was data analysis that normally I could do in the fashion of kind of redoing it every single time, making sure all the foundations is there, but since the foundation was never changing, I thought I'll make it a container, freeze it, and then make put that everywhere and that I needed to. I hope that ends up uh, being useful for everybody else. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, moving on to some of the other questions. There's one here about, is there any loss in performance when running tools via container? Um, if there is any loss, it's very minimal. Um, I mean, Pascal might have some additional comments on this, but um, usually the benefit that you get from running with a container far, far outweighs any very minimal performance loss that you might otherwise have. Yeah, so the, the main thing with the container right, is that if you want it to be portable to some extent, let's say you build it on in a system which has Intel architecture and you want to use all the flags that are available, that container could work on another system with the exact same architecture and would be as performant to some extent as it would be just running bare metal, like raw on that system, but then you lose portability. 
and it's it is a bit of a trade off. You'll lose some of the let's say maximum performance you could get, but if you're trying to deal with something and move it around, that's usually not an issue because then you'd have to go on the system, learn about the system, tweak it again, and then that you'll have to tweak it every single time. Whereas the slight loss in performance is it's probably okay. Uh, unless the particular workflow you're using is, is got some very specific switches where normally you're like, oh, I, I can half it in terms of time, compute time. But that's usually a rare instance. And so portability, reproducibility, and not having to do it every single time is your time less spent, right? Like remember, you're also spending time doing this everything. So you, here now you lose it, but you don't have to, you have to wait for compute because you have to reinstall stuff. You can just start running. And that in, in real terms, in terms of lifetime, you, you're saving yourself time. And uh, mental load and stress. Yes. All the time for coffee and chocolate. Exactly. Okay, so next question we have in the Q&A panel is, are containers OS, so that's operating system for those who are not familiar with that acronym, are they OS agnostic? Yeah, um, because they're isolated from your um, operating system and your software environment otherwise, um, you can run uh, like a Linux um, specific software on Windows or Mac or vice versa. Um, you specify within the container, um, like if you need an, a Ubuntu environment um, as a base, for example. So that's specified within the container, which means that you can run um, this software on any operating system. Great, thank you. And then next up, we have a question about uh, partitioning. And the question is, is it possible to partition system resources to a container? For example, if using an eight core machine, can four cores be dedicated to running the container? I mean, if you're using a Slurm scheduler or something like that, yes, you definitely can. Um, you would specify that like in your Slurm scripting. In terms of if you're running in that on something that isn't HPC, I'm actually not sure. Pascal, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, so the the resources that are provided to Singularity are kind of the resources where you launch it. So, so if you, let's say, set um, something so that, let's say, you're running multiple threads, it's a bit technical, but let's say you're setting multiple threads, you could set the OpenMP command outside of Singularity, you should then export that environment into Singularity if you do it, uh, if you export that the variable, and then Singularity should run stuff with less threads than it's available to the entire operating system. You can also make sure that the commands in the Singularity uh, can accept some environment variables. You can then provide those environment variables to Singularity saying, please export this. Uh, and if you have those used elsewhere in the commands that are run in Singularity, then they'll get used and you'll use a portion of the system. Uh, but if you're trying to really partition in a complex way, it does usually require some interaction with a scheduler. As far as I'm aware of, it's much harder to try to minimize and like thread bind. These are technical terms. So like if you have MPI and OpenMP and you want to make sure that you launch a certain number of MPI threads, each given a certain number of OpenMP threads bound in a particular fashion, that requires either lots of environment variable setting and then launching Singularity with all those things there and having programs that are aware, or having a job scheduler like Slurm kind of do this for you. And that's usually the much better approach. If you're usually partitioning stuff, it's usually because you are trying to run on a system which has lots of resources. And in which case they'll usually have job schedulers. Thanks. So the next question is about uh, environment and package man managers. Uh, and they want to know what are the key difference between containers and environment package management systems like Conda? Um, so with Conda, in a lot of ways, they do have a lot of overlaps um, and similarities in how you might use them. Um, so with Conda, you can specify um, different environments. And so you say, I want to install all of these very specific versions of these um, packages, and I want to call that, you know, environment genomics. Um, and then you can do like Conda activate your genomics environment, and suddenly you'll be running these particular versions of R or Python or you know whatever other tools it is that you've put in that environment. And then you can swap out, go to a different environment and run again, different versions of things. So in that way, it's quite similar to containers, but the difference um, I think largely would be that it is not um, operating system agnostic. So you um, 
you're still locally installing the softwares um, from Conda. Um, they're still living in your system as opposed to being isolated like that, um, like with a container. It's also not quite as easy to ship things around. Um, and I personally found with Conda, sometimes you will lock down a very, very specific version of something and then you go to launch that again. Um, and um, that isn't available or there's something. So it's not quite as um, robust and reproducible as a container, but it's certainly a good option for a lot of things. So I quite like Conda and I use it. I also use containers. So it kind of depends on exactly what it is that you're doing. Um, Pascal, if you have any extra comments on that, feel free to chime in. If not, no stress, no? <laughs> cool. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is a good one, I think. It's about best practice. And the person uh, is writing that they're trying to figure out what their best practice is on a daily basis. And do you recommend that they set up different environments in different containers and always package their work into containers from time to time? Or, or how would you approach it? Um, I mean, it's hard to know without knowing a little bit more about exactly what it is that you're trying to do and um, how your environment and your workflow is. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess really the answer would be it depends. Um, but if you are doing things, you know, repeatedly, um, then using putting your stuff into containers uh, means that you can do that once and then reproduce it quite easily. If you're only ever going to do this one particular thing one time, maybe it's not worth uh, like creating a container for that. Um, but you might find that you can download and use other people's containers to do these bits and pieces that you want to do, and that might make your life a bit easier. So yeah, it, it depends. I guess then that kind of leads into question, the question, when should you not use containers? Mm, good question. Um, I mean, you could use them for pretty much anything you wanted. So I struggled to find, um, I think, yeah, I struggled to find something where it's like, you absolutely should not use containers for that thing. Um, but I suppose like Pascal was sort of referring to earlier, if you have, um, a particular setup where it is really finely tuned for your particular machine architecture or something like that and you're getting a huge performance increase from having this very very specific configuration um, maybe using a container isn't super useful for that i don't know if you have any other thoughts on that pascal um so my only thought would be that besides that answer would be if the you haven't ever used containers before and you feel like you can do the porting or whatever you're doing faster than it would be to learn the container because you're only ever going to do it one other time then maybe it's not worth learning containers for you because you just don't have that knowledge uh because you're just going to do it once but if it's ever going to be more than once in terms of some some porting and that porting is complicated and doesn't require uh, fine tuning for performance because you really need that performance, then I'd suggest you learn containers and maybe think about using them because you don't want to have to spend your time doing this unless you really are required to. Uh, so the question that I have here is uh, trying to understand a bit more about is exactly where the containers sit uh, and do they use computer memory space? I'm happy um, to yeah. go with this one. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so from a technical standpoint, um, everything, a container is basically just a control group and a namespace. So a control group is what um, allocates resources memory and does the metering of system resources. And your, your native operating system uses that. A container just uses a different control group. So it uses, it's in the same system. So using, using exactly the same memory stack, exactly the same thing, it's just separated from the main operating system and the main kernel by that operating, by that control group. And it's also separated by a namespace, which is what it has, essentially what it has access to, what it can see. So that's why when you SSH into a container, you'll have process ID zero. But if you were to look at that container from the outside, it would have a, a user ID of something else. So it does just sit in your computer's actual memory. It's as if it's literally just processes running on your host OS. It's just there's barriers between those processes and the rest of the system, which is what is the container part of it. So it's all just, it's literally as if you're running it, 
on the Linux machine, you just have some extra barriers in place to separate things. So in short, yes, it does use memory space on your computer. That was a good answer. Thank you, David. Uh, I've just lost the question that I was about to ask. One moment, let me see if I can find it again. I think it was saying- briefly answered. Okay. About, um, but we can go into it. How can you, can you build a containers by combining two containers? Yes, that was the one. Yeah. Do you want to answer it since you just wrote the answer? Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the, I don't know of any way of merging two container images in any particular fashion. I don't think that is set up, but you can build on top of containers. So if you have Docker, Docker has a nice way of saying, go find this container and add this to this container using essentially a recipe, a Docker file. And so you can keep building on top of there. There'd be no real nice way of implementing a merge where you have two separate containers because you'd have to guarantee that their stacks are fully compatible and that that's a hard thing to do. So the process, the better way to think of it is if someone has built a container for you, but it's missing something, add to that container by essentially learning a bit of Docker, figure out how to add to that recipe, call that container and add a bit more, get a new container. And so is that using the from keyword, right? Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. when, when you build a container anyway, you usually start with from. So you might be say from Ubuntu, um, which is importing like the Ubuntu kind of base container. And then you would add on your bits and pieces on top of that. So in some ways you're all, whenever you write a container recipe, you're kind of always building on or merging, um, not merging, I guess, building on and a container already. Docker Compose is a good tool for this. Mm. Yeah, you could spend like a lot of time really getting into all of the gritty details and some people totally love it. Um, so it could be really quite interesting. So lots of options there. And then there's a question here about can uh, one container, uh, I'm getting tongue tied, let me try that again. Can one container on a VM be used by all users or does each user need to install their own container? Yeah, I would think that it should be available for all users. I can't really think of a reason why it wouldn't be, but Oh, Pascal, is that, would you agree with that? Is there some use case I haven't thought of? I, th I think so. I, I'm curious about the question. It probably needs some clarification. Do you mean that they interact in the same container so that they can see each other? Because that's, that's uh. not a container. So if you're running, you yourself get a container and you don't get to necessarily interact in a simple fashion with other users. Unless you are doing something with like bind mounting directories that you're all going to write to and read to and so on. So it's a bit complicated. It's not like an, a simple thing where you're all actually in the same operating system and you can just see who's available and like launch stuff together. It's, it's meant to be encapsulation um, for a, a user for a specific run. I don't know I if anybody else has another idea. I think it's something to do with it's there's what happens inside a container what versus what happens outside a container. If you are inside a container, you cannot see the outside world. You can only see the things that you have been allocated and the things that you have access to. So your processes, your process tree, your resource allocation, your libraries and your dependencies. You can't see anything else about the host system unless you change the way you make your container. In terms of if you're on outside the container in user land, you can see that the container is running. And if you are admin, you can SSH into that, change things about it. Um, so it honestly depends on how you have your permissions set up. So if you have your permissions up, set up such that multiple users have sudo or they have a, the SSH command to get into the containers, multiple users can go in and look and interact with that same container, but the container cannot interact with anything else. And generally, I think you'll find that that's probably multiple users using the same container isn't really gonna be the way you wanna do it because you'd probably want to have it, the container provides a service and then the users interact with said service instead. I think I can I can add a bit of clarification. There's the yeah. container image, which is the, essentially the, the infrastructure you're gonna kind of use and launch. And then when you invoke it, you get a container. And in that containerized environment, you're encapsulated. You see what's in the container, but everybody can share the same container image to then launch a container, a contained environment 
where they do stuff. So there's the image, essentially the file that is run by Singularity, by Docker, by other stuff to then generate a containerized environment, this, this container. But there's an image that's separate that everybody can obviously access as they would same kind of a file. Thanks very much. So one last question, which will segue us nicely into how to wrap up is, what were the hardest things about learning to use the containers? And I'm going to throw this over to Sarah, Pascal, and David, who whoever wants to chime in. And also, where would you start if you wanted to learn about containers? Um, I mean, I started learning about containers during my PhD. Um, so before I worked with Pawsey, I attended some of their training sessions about it. Um, and so I suppose for me, the most tricky thing was wrapping my head around some of the abstract concepts. Um, but then when I actually got into using worked examples of containers, um, I found that it was um, kind of more straightforward than I expected. So it just takes a little bit of, well, for me anyway, took a little bit of time to, um, and I suppose repeated exposures to understand um, you know, what's going on in the background with a container. Um, so, but I've found it super useful now and I use them a lot. So if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> Pascal or David, do you want to add your thoughts or experiences there? Yeah, so I can add at least mine because it's probably, it, it may also be like Sarah's a, a bit of a summary block in terms of the, the actual um, abstract ideas behind containers in the sense that I, because I had enough programming background, I figured, oh, I'll just jump in. And so I just jumped in and was like, where's this file? Where's this container image for Docker? Well, I can't find it. And it took me a while to realize that Docker manages it. It's kind of hidden from you. You can build on top of containers. I just kind of went straight into a recipe and said, okay, cool. And then was a bit lost on trying to build on top of recipes. So the advice I have at least is don't jump because it can be a little bit, even if you think you have lots of experience, it's good to kind of just go back and kind of look through step-by-step -step process and think about what you want to do. And that's the other thing I was gonna say is that the hard bit was also trying to figure out for, at least for me, when I wanted to use a container, because in, in some of my circumstances, right, I wanted high performance code that I wanted to compile from scratch every single place I got it, but the, the, there wasn't a dependency held or face. And so it was like, well, when do I actually want to use a container versus not? And so it's it's not necessarily hard, but it's something that you should think about, even though we've discussed that you can use containers often, make sure you feel like this is a great place to use it. Uh, I'll, I'll use it here. I think with bioinformatics, it's um, because you use so many different programs and they're often, um, you know, might not be very well maintained or they have a lot of dependencies. Um, I think for bioinformatics, it can be particularly useful um, whereas if you come from a different domain where you only really use a couple of programs in your workflow, but you really need big compute, then maybe it's less immediately obvious how it might be useful for you. I would say for getting started with computers, uh, try to do something stupidly simple first, um, like literally just maybe run a web server on a container on your laptop. And I think I personally learned a lot more from the process of trying to get that set up um, than I did from reading the documentation in the man pages. And in terms of the hardest thing I found, I think the hardest thing I found with containers is once you go below the surface of um, the commands that Docker exposes to you and how the build systems and the automated pipelines, and you're actually really trying to fine tune um, configurations parameters for very specific use cases, um, it becomes a bit of technological hell. So once again, I think reiterating what Pascal and Sarah have already said is that make sure that this is an, ap an application where containers are appropriate, because if you're trying to do something very, very highly specialized, um, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. I, I would um, add to that and say um, you're, yeah, I think, having a go is probably one of the best ways to learn. Um, I would change my definition of something very, very simple would probably be a bit different to you in that running a web server is um, maybe a little bit complicated if you're just starting out and you don't have a lot of command line experience. Um, so maybe something like, you know, running a hello world or um, 
type of thing where you just get the container to um, spit out a command, like spit out like a phrase, a bit of text, or maybe you just want to run like, you know, get the help message from Sam tool. So you know that your um, container is running and Sam tools is living in there and it's just saying, yes, I'm alive. Um, so maybe start with there rather than running a web server. Yeah, start with something that you already know how to do and then see if you can put that into the container and get it to work. That would be a good starting point, I think. And I, I just want to mention that there are a lot of containers out there now. So some of the, some of the stuff we talked about, you might not, in your case, uh, have to think about building containers. What's the process of building containers? It might be like, oh, there's this container and I need to know how to run the image. So I just need to figure out how to interact with the image and kind of manage resources of an image, but I don't need to worry about everything else. Uh, great if you want to explore like building containers and so on, but if it's somehow like there's a use case and someone's already doing it, they may have solved your bottleneck for you and follow their solution. Because there's, there's almost really no instance in which you need to really reinvent the wheel because the wheel's probably invented to be portable and, and useful for everybody. Um, so have, make sure you, before you go down the route of like going through everything, figure out what you need, see if it's there, see if you can think about how to just use it and have an understanding of how it's used though. That it is important to figure out how the container interacts with the outside world. It's one of the questions that I was trying to answer in the text. Great, thanks everybody. Those are some really useful tips. And to finish up, we have a few more things that might help you on that journey. And I'm just going to share my screen again. If you just give me a moment. So firstly, as you know, this webinar has been recorded and I'm going to post that both on the Australian Biocommons YouTube channel and it will also go on the Pawsey YouTube channel and we'll let you know when that's available. And you can have a look at uh, the Pawsey YouTube channel and the Australian Biocommons one for recordings of lots of other events as well. In terms of continuing to learn about containers and in particular containers in bioinformatics, there is an event coming up that Pawsey is running called an Ask Me Anything session on containers and bioinformatics. And this is really your opportunity to come along and join a conversation with experts on containers and other people who are using containers, swap ideas and advice and, and help you understand what it is that you're trying to do and get some solutions. So that's coming up on the 31st of May. And there's more information about that on the Pawsey website under their events banner. At Australian Biocommons, we also have lots of webinars and workshops on bioinformatics coming up and you can find out more about them on our website as well. As this was part of the Data Science Week events, there's still a few more events coming up during, during the week. I think there's a few on machine learning and some other interesting topics coming up too. So have a look at those as well. So that is all that we have time for today. Thank you to Sarah and to David and Pascal for joining us and sharing your thoughts and experiences. And thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Finally, the Australian Biocommons and the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre are enabled by ANCRIS and funding from the Australian and state governments. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again in another webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. <laughs>